Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Marta van Heuvel. I'm uh, I'm working at the Brain Center uh, in uh, in Utrecht. And uh, before I begin, I really would like to uh, thank uh, Patrick for uh, organizing this uh, fantastic meeting. So, as we've seen in the previous two talks, right, there is currently a large interest in mapping the connections of the of the human brain. Uh, both, I think as well as on the microscopic scale, as well as on the macroscopic scale. Yeah? On the microscopic scale, uh, most of the work now is mostly done in, in animals, uh, but some think that uh, perhaps future te uh, technology can also, in the future, help us on a connectome on the more higher resolution, perhaps even cellular, cellular level. Um, but for now, of course, we are stick to a more macroscopic scale if we want to um, to look into the human brain, and MRI is probably one of the one of the best techniques to do that. As we've seen, there are basically two flavors of techniques uh, most currently used. One is to reconstruct the anatomical connections of the brain uh, through means of uh, diffusion imaging, and the other one is resting set fMRI. Um, we've 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 heard already heard two talks about this, so I won't go into much detail here. So let's assume that we can make a comprehensive map of the neural interactions of the human brain, and above that, we can also have a measure of the functional interactions emerging from that anatomy. What in the end will, how, how, how will this map look like, right? Or probably something like this, right? It will be a bowl of spaghetti. Um, if we would even be able to reconstruct these connections on a high resolution, in the end, it will be quite a mess of connections. Um, so, and the, the point I'm trying to make this is that the connectome maps, or mapping the connectome alone, is not enough. It's not going to bring us further to understanding human brain function, or even the human brain, or even cognition. Right? So connectome maps are just a tool to make a map of the connections of the brain. And to, but if we want to understand something of those maps, we need an additional layer. Now, like we've seen, one of those layers is uh, graph theory. Now, graph theory is just a mathematical tool to understand the topology of a system. Um, like uh, Ed already nicely showed, we can divide a network into nodes, and we define the edges as the connections between those nodes. And then, using graph theory, which is actually quite an old part of math, we can reconstruct all these different metrics out of these, out of these graphs, like the communication distance, which we call path length or communication efficiency, or for example, the formation of modules or the level of local clustering. Now, in the past years, several studies have shown that these, these mathematical features from the brain, these topological organizational uh, attributes, are actually very important to uh, several, uh, several aspects of the brain. For example, they're, they're not uh, consistent over time, they're changed with development, uh, they're very heritable, uh, so likely very strongly influenced by, uh, genetic, uh, by our genes. Uh, and they also link to cognition. Um, I think some of the findings have been uh, shown by already by Ed that people with a higher IQ tend to have more efficiency, uh, but they've also been linked to um, having a higher modular organization. And also other uh, aspects of our personality uh, have been linked, for example, aggressiveness or other personality traits have been linked to uh, graph organizational features. Now, if it is true, and this is, again, a hypothesis, if it's true that the connectivity profile and the connectivity topology of our connectomes individually are so important for our cognitive abilities or for perhaps even for our, person, our personality, um, and so in that sense, perhaps even for who we are, then you can imagine that if this wiring is so important, then if there would be damage to it, it will have large consequences. And if there are so many wires in the brain, so many neurons being connected to other neurons, and even on a microscopic scale, the, the, the connectivity matrices that we make are pretty dense, so meaning there's a lot of connections, then you can say, well, if there are so many connections, Murphy's Law actually says something must go wrong in the end. Wires must be displaced, uh, changed, damaged, etc., which will have, eventually, effects for our cognitive abilities and perhaps our personality. And indeed, um, in the past five to ten years, there has been a massive increase in uh, studies examining or using the connectomic tools, both on the structure as well as on the functional side, uh, and linking that to uh, pathology. And this is, this is just a very busy slide, uh, mentioning a few disorders. And I will just snowball 
through, uh, through many of those uh, findings uh, reported recently. So if you are in the audience and your paper is not in here or your, even your, well, your bad disease is not in here, I apologize. I can only um, uh, discuss a, 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 few, a few studies, of course. But I think today many, uh, perhaps even all, uh, psychiatric disorders and neurological disorders have been, uh, or people are actually using connectomics to examine them. Uh, I think uh, the most examined studies of mo most examined disorder is AD uh, now. I think, uh, well, we've already seen the paper of uh, Randy Buckner in which they compared uh, amyloid deposition to a connectivity profile of the brain. Uh, but uh, there has also been other studies um, examining functional disruptions in the brain. Uh, Case Tom from the VU, uh, VU Medical Center in Amsterdam used MEG, so this is not MRI-based, but MEG-based uh, studies, and, and they too showed actually quite similar findings to what Randy Buckner found, namely that Alzheimer's is, is, is likely related or is, or is, is um, associated, uh, should I say, with a disruption of the overall global topology of the network. Um, other neurodegenerative disorders, uh, ALS. Um, uh, ALS, of course, has a strong lower motor involvement, but also a strong upper motor neuro involvement. And a few studies have used connectomics. Uh, Esther Vestata, who is a student in the lab, she um, mapped, she used the connectivity uh, maps to um, look in ALS patients, showing that preferably the motor network seems to be affected. And a similar finding was found, but now in the functional side by uh, Frederica Gosta, uh, showing that uh, besides motor network involvement, also other more frontal network tends to be affected in, in ALS. Um, these effects, these structural effects and functional effects seem not to be uh, independent, rather they, they tend to be dependent on each other. Uh, so more damage to structural pathways also tend to lead to more damage in the functional interactions between brain regions. And this is just a, an example in ALS, but I think there's been several other studies showing now that the structural anatomy effects are very strongly linked to, uh, or can lead to a disruption in functional dynamics. Uh, some findings in FTD. Um, uh, again, you would expect frontal effects, and indeed, uh, this is a study by Frederica Costa showing that indeed frontal hubs tend to be the most dam uh, damaged in, in FTD patients. Um, similar findings, or well, at least in, in terms of connectomics, have been found in uh, epilepsy. Uh, studies there too have shown that uh, disruptive uh, anatomy of the brain uh, may be uh, causing, or perhaps maybe um, um, supporting, uh, um, well, um, disruptive functional dynamics in those epilep uh, epileptic patients. Perhaps even suggesting that epileptic focus may relate to uh, obsessive uh, connectivity of regions. Um, connectomics has not only been used in, in uh, neurological disorders, but also I think in psychiatry, more and more studies are using these techniques to understand the neurobiology of those disorders. Most of the work has been done, I think, in schizophrenia, uh, and most of the work is actually coming from uh, the lab of, uh, at Bulmar from Cambridge University. Uh, the, one of their first studies they reported was, uh, was by Danny, Daniela Bassett, reporting on an affected hub structure and hierarchical organization of the connectome in those patients. And similar findings have been found in both fMRI as well as uh, later on in diffusion imaging. This is a paper by Andrew Zaleski uh, reporting that in particular pathways between what, what we know now, what we tend to know now is that these uh, pathways are particularly located to higher order uh, hubs, if you will, in the brain. And he was one of the first to show this. Uh, we, in the same time, we reported a rather similar thing uh, that patients with schizophrenia uh, report, uh, ha tend to have frontal regions that uh, have affected communication efficiency, um, so actually reduced communication efficiency, while other regions tend to be uh, less locally integrated. Um, I, think, I think this is one of the last slides on disorder. Autism, it's not only that these, these connectomics effects can have impact on um, on um, well, older patients, basically, uh, but also in autism. There's been a few studies in both uh, adult patients as well as uh, very young children. Uh, and, and I think all of those um, studies point into the direction that perhaps um, a, a deviating growth of the connectome um, might lead to these, these disorders. There's been a few studies with Keon and all showed uh, actually uh, increased connectivity of more visual regions and decreased connectivity of frontal regions. 
while uh, Maria Borsma did a study on very young toddlers in uh, having autism. These, those were two, uh, I think, two years old. Uh, and actually, already in those early uh, phases of the disease, we can we tend to find differences in connectivity structure of the connectome in those in those young kids. So this might, of course, give us uh, hope to use these techniques to perhaps as a biomarker. So the rest of my time, I like to spend on I think from all these studies, there's been there tends to emerge now three perhaps big questions in the use of connectomics in. Um, in pathology uh, studies. So the first question is actually, are those disease effects that we see, you've, you've seen a few, right? They have snowballed through all these studies. Uh, uh, are they disease specific? That's, I think that's an important question if we want to use these techniques in the future as potential biomarkers. So the second question is, does the connectome uh, in some way contain or perhaps facilitate um, the spread of disorder, of disease effects? And I will f show a few slides on what I mean by that. And I think the third point is um, already uh, touched upon by Ed, but I will go into, it, into this a little bit more. Are some points of the connectome uh, perhaps more vulnerable to disease effects? Perhaps rendering some critical points in the brain very vulnerable points that need to be protected in some way to keep on a uh, healthy brain function. So the first question is, are connectome changes uh, disease specific? Now, one of, the, one of the first, I think, uh, suggestions made in literature about one of those functional connectivity networks being helpful as a biomarker for disorders is probably the full bond network. And the full bond network um, is uh, perhaps, uh, it's very likely that you already heard of it, but it's a network that is more active during rest, and uh, people have tend to uh, suggest it to be as a sort of global gatekeeper of activity in the brain, and, and it's, for example, uh, suggested to be related to um, uh, processes like uh, looking at yourself and, and mind wandering, etc. Um, now, disruptions into the full bond network has been, uh, like I said, mentioned in Alzheimer's disorder uh, and also in MCI patients. So this was, I think, very promising. And studies have actually hypothesized this network as a well, disruption in this network to be a potential biomarker for the disorder. However, um, the default one network disruptions has also been mentioned in ALS, unfortunately, uh, which, which make the, um, the, well, the default one network itself perhaps less useful as a potential biomarker. And also in FTG, epilepsy, autism, ADHD, depression, schizophrenia. Well, you get my point, right? And I think also bipolar disorder. And I'm not joking this up. I'm, we actually did a recent study in which we uh, just did a simple PubMed research on uh, typing in the full mode network disruptions disease, uh, disease and you just pinpoint all of, you get a list of these disorders and actually there are many many more so in that in that way we should uh, I'm not saying that we cannot use this as a biomarker but I think we have to be careful about saying that certain effects in certain networks are very strongly disease specific so other options might, of course, be the network met metrics that we talked about, right? We talked about the small wilderness, and we talked about randomization, global clustering, global efficiency, and again, all of these effects have been reported actually across many, many disorders. So again, these global metrics might not be as informative as we, um, as we thought, perhaps, uh, well, um, well, as we thought before, I actually hoped before. Uh, so again, I'm not saying that these cannot be used as a biomark. I'm just saying that perhaps we have to be careful about their specificity. And in that, in that way, perhaps we should compare it to what we had uh, 10, 15 years ago when we discover, discovered that dis disorders like Alzheimer's and schizophrenia were related to reduced brain volume. But now we know that almost all disorders lead to reduced brain volume. Uh, or most of them. So uh, brain volume itself is not specific. But perhaps if we zoom in and we just don't look at um, uh, global effects of network disruptions, but look at specific network disruptions, there might be many, much more uh, information there. And I think, um, I think there is. 
So that's that's the I think that's the good side. I think the glass is for sure half full. I think it's actually a little bit fuller even. So one of the uh, I think the pioneers in this field is uh, is uh, the work of Seely. So what he did he uh, in, in in a series of study he started to compare different types of neurodegenerative disorders. In this case, AD, FTD, SD. Uh, well, you, you see it on the slide. And what he found is that most of the atrophy effects tend to be focused to specific functional networks. So these different types of of um, uh, neurodegenerative disorders, they tend to all lead to reduced connectivity, but the connectivity tends to be, if you just zoom into different areas, tend to be localized to the different functional domains. So that lead actually to, I think, a, a new line of hypothesis uh, in the field, and that is the question of does the connectome in some way facilitate spread of disease, uh, disease effects? So if we would look at the connectome as just a, as a network of, of highways, for example, then you can imagine that big roads, so uh, having a lot of lanes, can facilitate more traffic. So in that way, they can also facilitate more disease effects trans being transported from place to place over the brain. And indeed, um, again, the group of Seeley uh, reported, again on the same disorders, that the atrophy effects across those different types of disorders are actually tend to be related not only to the functional domains, but also perhaps being facilitated by the underlying connectivity structure of the network. So for example, if you see here the, the network on the right, um, the red spot would be what he called the epicenter of the disease effect. That's where the disease starts. And then over time, regions becoming, that are directly connected to those epicenter regions are, have a higher probability of becoming affected over time. And so what he hypothesizes is that these different epicenters, the different disorders have different epicenters in different functional regions. And interestingly, we found a similar thing in ALS, um, in which we compared ALS patients. We followed a group of ALS patients over time. We measured them at two time points, and we compared them to controls. And what we found is that the disorder actually tends to increase over time in terms of, of uh, affected regions. So... Just as a cartoon, this is the regions affected in uh, time point one, and then in time point two, more and more regions spreading across the connectome tend to be, become involved in the disorder. So the last question, um, and, and like I said, Ed already touched upon this, is are some points of the connectome perhaps more vulnerable? Or rephrasing it, is the connectome structure, as it is in our brain now, uh, facilitating cognition, etc.? Does this structure in some way create, um, unintentionally perhaps, vulnerability hotspots that damage in those regions will have severe consequences for, for brain function? And indeed, hubs uh, being um, points of, of high connectivity in the brain, uh, they are of, are of course our first candidates to look at those, those effects. Um, and... Um, like, like, like mentioned before, uh, several studies have shown the existence of these hubs in both as structural connectivity as well as functional connectivity. And um, uh, not only are these hubs individually connected highly, uh, so high, uh, they have a high degree individually, but also they tend to form strong, densely connected uh, clubs. And uh, Olaf Spons and I, were, um, we, we took on this endeavor to explore this rich club structure in the brain and perhaps also look at its function a little bit. And I think what we most recently found is that these hubs, these anatomical hubs, they're not just located in one specific functional domain of the brain, but they tend to be distributed across the entire cortex, perhaps facilitating, as an anatomical structure, um, perhaps functional integration between different regions in the brain. And I think the most interesting thing that we found is that, uh, indeed, those rich club and the connections between those rich club nodes, which we call the rich club edges, tend to be the most prominent among connections that actually span between different functional domains in the brain. So our hypothesis now is that it forms a not just a global infrastructure for communication in the brain, but perhaps a, just a higher order system for integration of information between different functional domains. And you can imagine that if damage is happening in those regions and in those edges, and it will have a severe consequence on global integration of information in the brain. And this is indeed what we tend to see um, uh, across different disorders. This is a recent paper we wrote about this 
about Hobbes in general, and we briefly touched upon uh, these different disorders. Again, uh, Alzheimer's is probably one of those disorders that's on the candidate list. Uh, Randy already showed that the amyloid deposition tends to be the most severe in these cortical hub regions. And uh, Willem de Haan actually wrote a recent paper, a very interesting paper, on using functional dynamics uh, models to, to, uh, to see what the effects of damage are to the functional dynamics of the brain. Um, coma has already uh, mentioned before uh, as well. Uh, this is a paper by Stephen Loray's review paper in which he showed that across different states of consciousness, uh, in particular the precuneus hub uh, region tend to be the most strongly affected across the brain. Uh, but also in schizophrenia, uh, hub, uh, reduced hubness has been reported. Daniela Bassett was one of the first to report this. And later on, we touch upon this by showing that uh, if you just compare the healthy hubs in the brain to the regions most strongly affected in schizophrenia, then there tends to be a strong overlap. Um, and indeed, we found that in particular, reach of edges, so the con edges be connecting the hubs of the brain tend to be the strongly affected uh, in this patient population and also in their healthy siblings, suggesting a possible genetic effect of this, this, um, of this effect. And interestingly, um, I think schizophrenia has, for a very long time, already been mentioned as a disorder that particularly tends to affect um, integration of information in the brain. So as a concluding slide, uh, the brain is a network. I hope that we uh, try and can convince you uh, this afternoon on that. And that conversely, abnormal wiring uh, in the connectome might lead to several neurological and psychiatric brain disorders. Um, many people to thank. Um, well, they're on the list, in particular Olaf Spawns, in which most of the Risk Club uh, fund has been, uh, been done, in particular people from the funding agencies that are willing to uh, fund my work. Thank you.